honor estar aquí con ustedes. What an honor to be with all of you here today. Um, I find that little one minute snippet very powerful. And it's what we're going to talk about today. Zip codes versus destiny. Um, we're going to talk about equity in education. I am a sixth grade teacher from Utah, where diversity means you found a Presbyterian. Yes, I know. And, um, and yet I went out of my way to teach my kids what equity meant. So we've got the pie, literally the pie. And I'd say, OK, you get to cut the pie, Lonnie. But Brandon gets to pick the slice he wants. So you would see them like so careful to make sure it was totally equal because no one was going to, if they cut a bigger piece of pie, they weren't the ones that were going to get it. It meant something to them having that equality. Lafayette Elementary School in Upper Northwest Washington has this incredible library. It's like the largest uh, school library in the district. It has more than 28 thousand books on two floors of library space, 12 miles away on the other side of the Anacostia River is Drew Elementary. It has 300 books and nothing but empty shelves in their library. <coughs> they um, have no funding for their school library. They rely on people donating old books so that they can fill the few shelves they have. Lafayette, um, coincidentally, is in a predominantly affluent white neighborhood. And Drew Elementary is, coincidentally, in a predominantly poor African-American neighborhood. Library budgets were cut from all over the school um, district, but Lafayette parents every year have a fundraiser, and they raise $10 thousand dollars because they want new books for their kids in the library and they say this is what our children need to learn the point is drew elementary parents want their kids to have everything they need to learn too <coughs> excuse me this is part of the conspiracy someone has wants to silence my voice the gaps between what the have kids and the have not kids have in schools is growing, just like the gaps in the have and have not parents' income is growing, just like the security gaps in their grandparents' retirement security is growing. Inequality in our public schools is mostly out of sight, out of mind, Here's what you might not know if you just drive past a public school on your way to work. You might not know that in the richest neighborhoods, they have more gifted and talented programs than schools in the poorer neighborhoods. You might not know that schools in the richer neighborhoods have art, have music, have the theater department. They've got athletics programs. They've got more of that than the schools in the poorer neighborhoods. Schools in the richer neighborhoods are much more likely to have new computers, be connected to broadband, have more science equipment, have newer textbooks, have guidance counselors, have school psychologists, have all of the things that their kids need. They're more likely to have more experienced credentialed teachers who stay who want to make a career in that school, who have deep roots in the community and really get to know those families. And you don't always know the different needs of families themselves. Students in more affluent neighborhoods have a higher percentage of parents who go to college. And that usually means that those parents make more money, which is why they live in affluent neighborhoods, and they can afford more things like um, a ticket to a museum, going on vacation, uh, visits to the doctor, food. The resources at home and the resources at school seem to correlate, interestingly enough, to uh, results 
in that school. Students in wealthier schools have higher rates of graduation. They have higher rates of college attendance. They have higher rates of kids who are accepted into selective colleges. None of this is rocket science. You could have probably guessed all of this. Um, what you might not know is that all of this has very little to do with intelligence. Um, when you compare kids in rich neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods, kids in very different income levels, who all got at least 1,200 uh, points on the SAT scores, pretty much equally prepared academically. Rich kids go to college. Um, and poor kids go to college with those high SAT scores. 82% of the rich kids graduate from college. 44% of the poor kids graduate from college. There's no difference in the desire to go to college. There's no difference in the preparation they had for being successful in college. There's no difference in test scores, in their intelligence. The difference is in home and school resources. The difference is money. And no, money doesn't buy happiness. But what does poverty buy? I'll tell you what's very easy for anyone to see. We are now going in to year 13. How old were you 13 years ago? Year 13 of no child left untested. Um, <laughs> And we can actually see what happens when you distract people, as No Child Left has distracted us, when you distract people from really looking at the resources, the programs, the services that would actually help close those achievement gaps by ignoring the gaps in resources between affluent students and poor kids by redefining education by hit your cut score on a standardized test, um, we've gone backwards in that important federal role, which was to be the watchdog, the guardian, guarding every child's opportunity to learn. And we have deepened the class divides in public schools. The dirty little secret in public school equity is um, that it's not really a difference between poor states and rich states. There really aren't entire states that have all rich schools or entire states that have all poor schools. The difference is internal to the state and sometimes even internal to the school district, as we can see in the Washington, D.C. school districts, libraries. Every single state has incredibly well-resourced schools. Every school district, uh, every state has a school district with to die for public schools. Nationwide, 80% of the most affluent families in America send their children to a neighborhood public school. They can afford private school. They choose the neighborhood public school. Why? They have a to die for public school. They sold a kidney to afford a house in that neighborhood because they wanted their kids to go to that fabulous neighborhood public schools. And in those very same states, there are public schools in crisis who are barely meeting the needs of some of the most vulnerable students, the students that won't be in Little League if there's not an athletic program for them, the students whose parents can't afford music lessons for them if there's not a music program in the school. These schools have leaky roofs and unsafe playgrounds and not enough books. Every single state has both kinds of schools because of the way we fund our public schools. Under No Child Left, inequality, inequity in resources and programs and services has been completely ignored. And what a child needs to succeed is not on anyone's radar. It's actually taking us in the opposite direction. They're saying you get less of all that good stuff the arts, athletics, higher level thinking skills. You get less of that so that we can maximize your time spent 
drilling to get your bubble kids to reach a little bit higher test scores. Children have been irreparably harmed by this obsessive test and punish policy that is not just out of no child left. States have to take their own responsibility for what they're doing there. But no child left set the tone that that was the expectation. And I'm here today not to complain about that, although I could go on for 16 hours about how bad it is. We have a chance to get out of this nightmare, to wake up and do something very positive. NEA, the National Education Association, is a union. And there are a lot of people who uh, might believe they know what our union does and who we are. And there are other people who have absolutely no idea who we are. So I thought I would take a moment to explain to you why I'm hopeful because of our union that we have a chance to do something uh, very, very good. We advocate for our members. We're the teachers and the bus drivers and the community college professors and the special ed assistants uh, and the lunch ladies. Um, we represent the men and women who work in an American public school, college, or university. Um, and the NEA listens very deeply to our members and what they have said to us since the beginning of No Child Left Behind and even before that, they've said, we want you to fight for our students so that we're given what we need to give them what they need from preschool to graduate school. Literally, we fight for Head Start programs in preschool. We fight for affordable college uh, for our uh, seniors going into, uh, going into the university. We fight for class size and for school computers. And we've been doing things like this since 1857, when I was 12. Um, after the Civil War, we started fighting for these things called public schools. We didn't actually have states that, that had thought about public schools actually educating everybody. Horace Mann came up with this idea, this lawyer from Massachusetts said, um, look at our country. We need a place where little citizens can come, citizens that don't go to church together, uh, whose parents don't work together, who never socialize, but some place where everybody in the community will come and they'll learn, these little people, to work together. They'll learn to respect each other. And we'll have these little citizens grow up to be big citizens who form a community. It was amazing. And he said, here's how we can do it. Because people were saying, how can you afford to, to do this? This is just something that people should pay for in private schools. And he said, no, we will get these young, smart, unmarried women to be the teachers. Um, and they'll work as hard as men and we can pay them less. So we gave we, him points off for that part of the plan. Um, but luckily, um, he encouraged the professional training of teachers to do this amazing work. Today, um, in education, do we have educators out there? I know it's a school day, so we've got, yes, we've got, yay. Uh, we are still about 75% women in uh, in the teaching ranks, um, but in most states, I'm happy to report that we have been successful in removing the laws requiring vows of poverty, obedience, and chastity. Um, we're still working on Utah, of course, but um, because, I think because we have been um, a majority of women, we have this incredible social justice heart. People are drawn to education because they really do care about someone else's child, whether they're a man or a woman. And so um, women's issues have always been very big in the National Education Association. Surprise, surprise. Our very first woman president was in 1910. It was Ella Flagg Young. She was this fiery teacher suffragette fighting for votes for women. Children's issues have always been important to the NEA. In the time of Mother Jones, we were out there saying that little children should be in school instead of in the mines, instead of in a factory losing their fingers.
We've always fought for things like the civil right to a public school. We, uh, in the 1960s, merged with the American Teachers Association. This was the association that represented black teachers, mostly in the segregated South. And the ATA and the NEA came together and we formed a fund so we could defend the rights of black teachers that were being fired in the South for participating in subversive activities like voter registration drives. This is who we are. It's why I'm so proud of being a leader in the National Education Association. We are an organization that demands respect for the educators who work in public schools and we demand that true opportunity to learn for every student, no matter what his or her zip code. And so I'm very comfortable here at NEA. Um, Equity has been the cause of my life. It's what I fought for uh, when I started teaching in the suburbs of Salt Lake City. I uh, later taught at a homeless shelter. I've taught in a facility that um, housed hard to place foster children, children who had been removed from their families. A lot of my kids from the homeless shelter, I would meet again at the children's shelter after they had been removed from their families. I started in a Head Start program. Um, I believe in my heart and soul that the opportunity to learn is the foundation of everything. No pressure. Everything. It's the economy. It's justice. It's crime prevention. It's health. It's the arts. It's culture. It's strong families. It's strong communities. It's democracy. It is world peace. You have to have those blessed little people growing into happy, whole adults who understand their responsibility, who are critical thinkers, who know when someone's trying to sell them something. They have to have a decent chance to live the lives they want to live. So it's very simple. If the opportunity to learn is the foundation of everything, we actually need everything. We ask for everything. There's a long, long list. People that say, well, we should start with um, preschool. No, we should start prenatally. I want to make sure mom was able to get to an obstetrician. I want to make sure that family has a living wage, that they're able to care for the children that are going to come into their lives. We care about health care. I know what happens when a student comes to school and can't afford to go to the doctor because they have a sore throat and they come to school with strep throat. I know what happens uh, when you don't have parental leave for a parent. I know that mom is going to bring um, big sister home to care for little brother. And I know that when kids are out of school, when they have too many absences, they feel so far behind. When they get back to school, they get discouraged. And they are our largest group of dropouts. It correlates absences with dropouts. I care about affordable preschool and Head Start and early childhood education and yes, affordable college and ending the crippling crisis of crushing student debt because our state legislatures are continually underfunding and underfunding and underfunding higher education. Today, the average college student is graduating with $30,000 dollars in debt. They are starting their lives behind. And it's becoming something that only wealthy families can even hope to achieve for their students. All of these things, all of them are important. All of them serve the whole child. But I want to focus the rest of my time on one immediate urgent interest because it's happening in real time right now. Um, we want to return sanity to the K-12 system. And it's not that the K-12 system was perfect um, before, but the insane testing obsession 
has burdened our schools now for 13 long years with this passage of the absurdly and ironically named No Child Left Behind. It is on the front burner in Congress even as we speak. It is moving through the hands of senators and congressmen to make political decisions that will affect public schools. I mean, what could go wrong? Um, I actually had a friend that said, well, at least they couldn't make it worse. <laughs> this is Congress. You know, they consider that a challenge. Oh, yeah? Watch us. Um, so let's take a minute and talk about the opportunity we have to learn something about No Child Left and what we can do about it. It passed um, decades ago. Decades ago, it wasn't 2002, it was 1965. It had a nice boring name, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. It was originally ESEA and it was designed precisely to give our most vulnerable students the opportunity to learn. And it's taken us now in the opposite direction. We can turn this around. Um, incoming history lesson. So the original law, 1965, is signed by Lyndon Johnson as part of the War on Poverty. It's part of the civil rights movement. This is when um, children of color, children in poverty, English language learners, children with special needs are pretty much being ignored in too many places as schools are being desegregated. Um, we see that more white affluent students are getting a better deal than children in poverty in high minority areas. So when it had a boring name, we actually loved this law. ESEA gave some modest but very important extra funding to schools that had high populations of children in poverty, children who face discrimination, children with disabilities. And every 10 years, it's reauthorized. Every 10 years, NEA would get up there and we lobbied with one word, more. Give us more for special ed funding. Give us more Title I reading tutors. Give us more technology. Give us more teacher training. All of the things that were funded in that original ESEA. In 2002, Democrats and Republicans came together. So you can understand why I never um, get uh, comforted when someone says, oh, they're going to do something bipartisan. Bipartisan gave us no child left. And what they left behind was common sense. Um, I don't know how many brain cells were sacrificed in service to a law that basically says, literally says, from 2002 to 2014, you have to have a higher percentage of kids that hit a cut score on a math and reading standardized test until the magical year of 2014 and forever after. 100% of human type children must hit that cut score or that child is labeled failure. Your teacher is labeled ineffective. Your school is labeled having not met adequate yearly perfection forever after. If your school cannot reach this statistical impossibility, and no school can, if one child misses the cut score on one of those tests by one point, the punishments kick in. If no child left, is not fixed this year. Next year, there are actual studies that show that 99% of all American public schools will be labeled failure. And 99%, I believe, is a conservative figure. Um, and it would be laughable if it wasn't so incredibly dangerous to students. This law, by the way, gives a child no right to anything no right to services, no right to that school nurse, no right to all the things that more affluent students can expect in their schools. No affluent school in 13 years was closed down 
and hand it over to a charter company because it didn't have enough special ed students hitting the cut score on a standardized test. For students who live in poverty, this law is more than an annoyance. This law is a tragedy. The unintended consequences of this law have been to doom our most vulnerable students to schools that have been, become testing factories, schools that limit the opportunity to learn only what is on that standardized test, only to memorize the factoids that are going to be on a math and reading standardized test. The purpose for millions of students now is hit your cut score on a standardized test. We know that the focus of standardized testing has been a distraction from making sure students have that broad, rich opportunity to learn. And politicians who have hyperventilated over um, cut score differences, oh my gosh, look at, look at what gaps we have in our test scores, have not said one word, have been deafeningly silent about the growing gap in the resources, the programs, the services, the opportunities to learn in those schools, and we want to change that. We are asking Congress to end the absurdities of test and punish by standardized testing. That's number one. But you have to replace it with something better. We are asking for a dashboard of better indicators. Now, in my car, I can get in my car and there's a dashboard that tells me stuff. I can tell if I've got a full tank. I can tell how fast I'm going. I've got this annoying check engine light that I just kind of ignore because, but I really should go in and have a professional take a look at why that's flashing. Something's going on there. I want a dashboard of evidence of student success. Um, and I want that dashboard to include opportunities to learn. I want to know, are all kids getting a fair shake at that opportunity? So on that dashboard, you can disaggregate by race, ethnicity, uh, English language learners, poor kids, rich kids, special ed kids. You can say how many schools have an advanced placement program. What do the kids in those programs look like? Who has an opportunity to gifted classes? Who has an opportunity to classes that give you college credit while you're still in high school? Um, who has tests that are locally developed that show a close alignment between what's being taught in the classroom and what's being tested? How are kids doing on locally developed uh, assessments? Which kids have improved attendance? Which kids? have completed capstone projects that teach collaboration. We want a dashboard for the first time. Since 1965, people have talked about the opportunity to learn. We want a dashboard that says, and who's getting that opportunity? We know what equity looks like. I had a reporter who said, so we know what you guys would do with that. You'd say, OK, um, all kids have to have a class size of 12, or all kids have to be in an AP class. And you know that every, everyone's going to look like um, they are, they're not doing much. And I said, no, no, no. You go into that to die for public school, elementary, middle, and high school, in every state. And you know where they are in your states. I know where they are in Utah, Park City. Um, you go into that to die for school, and you have a checklist. And you say, school nurse? Counselors, school psychologists, what kind of services and support staff do you have for those students? Programs, honors classes, vocational programs, theater departments. All right, checklist. And then you go and that is your benchmark. You go into every other public school and you judge it against what you did for the most affluent students who had parents that said, that's why I'm moving to this neighborhood, because that's what my kids need. You say, if those kids need it, all kids need it. And you make your benchmark. What you do for the best public schools in your state, you do for every public school in your state. And the third thing we want, we want authority. We want professional respect 
professional authority to actually be the ones who design what happens in that school when kids aren't succeeding. And by the way, those test score gaps do show a gap between what more affluent kids and what kids in poverty are achieving. They just don't tell us why, they don't intervene, they don't say, so here are the supports that we should be giving these kids, and it could be very, very different depending on what school you're in. But when you see those records of success or not, you don't get some one-size-fits-all mandate from people who are three levels outside that school who have never seeing the kids that are going to be affected by those decisions. You put authority in the hands of the people who know the names of those kids to say, here's what we're going to do for instruction. Here's how we're going to collaborate. Here's a discipline problem. Uh, here's a discipline uh, program that will solve problems and teach kids responsibility so we end that school to prison pipeline. Here's what we're going to do for our students. More and more professional decisions are being taken out of the hands of those teachers and the support staff in that school. And what we want is for accountability to mean something. As you talk about accountability, it's come to mean how many teachers get fired. Accountability without authority is a setup. Accountability without holding politicians accountable for the resources to ensure educational opportunity is a setup. We want to teach that whole child. There's a lot standing in our way. We want to build something new, but first we have to get rid of those barriers in our way. We want to get rid of test and punish. We want to get rid of this belief that you can ignore resources and actually serve kids. We want to give authority to those building professionals to design something that makes sense for the students in their care. And the biggest barrier that we need to remove is no child left untested. We must go back to Elementary and Secondary Education Act. We must go back to the ESEA and its focus on making sure our most vulnerable students have the opportunity to learn. There is no more important work ahead of us. There is nothing more important to getting that done than bringing us all together. I heard a story once um, about a dad who's just trying to read the paper and his little kid keeps pestering him and wants attention and the dad is a little frustrated. He looks down on the coffee table and he sees a National Geographic magazine open to a map of the world and he gets this great idea and he rips out the map and he tears it into little pieces and he gives it to the little boy and he says, let's play a game. This is a puzzle. Um, I want you to go into the kitchen and get the tape, and you have to put the map together, uh, put the puzzle together, and the rules are you can't talk until it's all done. So he thinks he's got a couple of hours. The little boy goes off into the kitchen and comes back in a couple of minutes. And the dad says, wow, how did you do that? And the little boy says, well, it's kind of a trick. He turns the paper over. He says, see, there's a kid's picture on the back. And if you put the kid together first, the world just comes together all by itself. That is our goal. That is our challenge. We have to put that whole child together first. I represent 3 million educators who live in every state. Um, and we're going to keep fighting for that whole happy child to become the whole happy adult, to be prepared to take advantage of every opportunity in their lives, to create, to invent, to organize, to think, to collaborate, to learn for the pleasure of learning for the rest of their lives. And it's not arrogance when I tell you that our work is the future 
of everything. That whole child is the future of everything. And it's a profound responsibility that we feel as educators in our bones. It's the DNA of the NEA. And three million people give you incredible power. Three million people won't be enough. We need you. If you don't work in a public school, college, or university, if you're a parent, a grandparent, if you're an uncle or an aunt, if you're just someone who cares about someone else's child, if you're just a cold-hearted business person who says, we care about that child because nothing else in this world will work if we don't have well-educated children. Whatever reason you have, we need you to be true believers with us that the whole child, preschool to graduate school, is the way forward. It means that you'll join us in calling your senator, calling your congressman or congresswoman to get ESEA right, that you'll go up to edvotes.org slash opportunity, and you'll sign a pledge we have thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have signed this pledge, and we report to senators and Congress uh, people that uh, we have thousands of people joining us every day. It means you'll take your cell phone out and you'll type to 83224, and you'll type the word student in the message box and that will connect you to this incredible network of information as things are actually moving in real time through Congress, as committees and floor votes are being taken, we will let you know and you will be connected with your senator or member of Congress to let your voice be heard with ours. The whole student has a chance with millions and millions and millions of people advocating for that whole student. I've been a teacher for now hundreds of kids over my career. Um, and I have deeply loved every single blessed student I've ever had, even the ones that drive me crazy, um, sometimes them most of all. I taught in schools that had so much. And I've taught in schools that had so little. And I understand. I understand, and maybe only um, a way a teacher can understand that incredible responsibility we have as all the advocates are trying to do everything they can for the future opportunity in that school. A kid's going to walk into my classroom tomorrow. What's my responsibility to take whatever I was given or not given? and construct something that will open their minds, that will have them debate current events or create something with um, the art supplies that I bought out of my pocket. Um, and that is a weird profession where you steal things from home and bring them to work. You know, but that, that is what we do. It's my job every day to invent something and put something in front of my students where they go, oh, I get it. I love being in your classroom. That was my evaluation. I know that all of my colleagues do that every day. But I also know that the year my friend across town had 22 fifth graders in her class, I had 39. I knew, I know that she had a school nurse and I was given a box of Band-Aids and rubber gloves. I know that it was the zip code that made the difference in the resources that we had to do our jobs. And I know that we have an opportunity to bring justice to our school systems. Our goal is to make that zip code a number and not a destiny. And that is the great mission 
of the National Education Association, and it's not a mission you'll find on our website. It's a mission that is written across the heart of every educator I've ever met, the way it's written in my favorite poem. Give me your hungry children, your sick children, your homeless, your abused children. Give me your children who need love as badly as they need learning. Give me your children who have talents and gifts and skills, and give me those that have none. Give them all to me, no matter what language they speak, what, no matter the color of their skin, no matter what shape they come in, no matter where they find God. Give them to me. And the people in this public school will give you the doctors and the engineers and the carpenters will give you the ministers and the lawyers and the teachers of tomorrow. We'll give you the mothers and the fathers and the thinkers and the builders and the artists and the dreamers. We will give you the American dream. We will give you the future. If you believe in the future of everything, join us. Mil gracias, mis hermanos y hermanas. Thank you for the honor of having me this morning. And I believe we have time for questions. I hope you have answers. But if you don't, we'll just make them up. Um, and we have a microphone here at the beginning, and we've got about 15 minutes left. Hello. I honestly cannot see you. Lily, you know I love you. <laughs> Lee Vandenacker, Salt Lake City, Utah. And I love you, Utah jokes and all. This week. Sorry about that. Oh. I just can't resist. And I, and I love working in a central city school, and I don't want to work in Park City. However, this week in our wonderful state, unanimously out of the Senate, it was voted to give science, math, chemistry, and special ed teachers a $10,000 raise. What does that say to all of us? in a time where we need more deliberate teaching of social and emotional skills to our students. And yet, our policymakers are saying we need more math, science, teachers. What's going to happen to our students? You said in your own words, no child left behind, left behind common sense. My fear is, are we going the same way? Are we in danger? with the Common Core? And if so, what would you tell us are the red flags that we need to watch out for now? And thank you, thank you for all the wonderful work that you do. And thank you, and I am so sorry that you have to put up with the Utah State Legislature. Um, um, that's just cruel and unusual punishment. Um, a, a comment on the first, uh, on your first uh, rhetorical question, you know, what's wrong with them? Uh, to say, all right, here's a little bonus for teachers that teach things we somehow value because it's science, math, technology. Um, and I love science, math, and technology. I actually have a master's degree in educational instructional technology, which I got in 1983 on an Atari 800. So I'm <laughs> working to upgrade my skills. Um, there are things called mouses now. Um, but they are so wrong when they think that $10,000 is the way to attract people who want to teach science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, if you're looking to make a whole bunch of money, uh, you're not going to be attracted to a public school anyway. You know what attracts most of us, no matter what we teach? That we'll be able to have the professional dignity and the professional responsibility to do our jobs and the, and the supports to do our jobs. Um, so it, it speaks very poorly of the Utah State Legislature that they don't understand what motivates a teacher and they don't understand that if an elementary, if a kindergarten teacher isn't given the supports that she needs, that they're never going to make it to a calculus class in high school, that it is a pipeline of services and that we are collaborative professionals. Um, so I'm sorry about that. Let me say a little something about the Common Core. We could have a whole different, um, a whole different uh, section on the Common Core. Um, I love 
some of the standards in the Common Core. I actually have an app on my phone. You can get it. It's the Common Core app and read them because they're so controversial. I love this Common Core language arts standard. And a standard, by the way, this, these are just standards. Every kid at this grade level should know this stuff. They should know their times tables in the fourth grade. I mean, it's pretty basic. They should know this stuff no matter where they live in the country. And your state legislature is um, it, whether or not they want to adopt the Common Core. It's up to the states. It's not a federal program. Um, but I love this Common Core that says, a student will give an opinion and the reason and evidence for that opinion I would so put Rachel Maddow and Bill O'Reilly on a YouTube talking about something they disagree with. I could show sixth graders, I could show high school students. Listen to these two give their opinion. Tell me the reason and evidence Rachel gave. Tell me the reason and evidence Bill gave. Whose side are you on? Let's divide the classroom up. We're going to have a debate. You have to give me your reason and evidence. I can do that with the Common Core. When they start saying, here's the Common Core, and we're going to tell you what textbook to use, and we're going to tell you what tests to use, and we're going to tell you what training you get, and they forget the professional dignity and authority of that, stu of that teacher that says, the standards, I'll, I, I like the standards, but I'll decide the lessons. I'll decide the textbooks. I'll decide the materials I need. I want to collaborate with my colleagues on the building level. Everywhere they're doing this where it's top down is going to fail. And everywhere where they're doing it from the school up without high stakes punishments attached to some standardized test, they will make the Common Core sing. I'm a junior in high school right now, and I was wondering what advice you would give to a student trying to overcome the disadvantages of going to a low-income, high-minority school. Again, the, the two things that we're working on, on, on the long-term level, you have to have the advocacy. You have to have the march. You have to have your voice calling your senator, calling your state legislators, calling your governor. And um, you have to have that connection with true believers. The NEA is three million people, and we're an organization, but we're an organization of three million very passionate educators who actually pay dues out of our own pocket so that we can have an organization that advocates effectively for public schools. Join an organization that works for you. Um, part of the, the things here, one of the things you can do is um, put that on your, your text. Go up to edvotes.org. But you also have state organizations of students, of parents, of educators, of people who advocate for poverty issues. Join them because we are nothing but our collective voices. One voice can be very, very powerful or can be completely ignored. It's hard to ignore millions of people dozens of organizations that are all saying the same thing. You fight, you organize, you go, fight, win. Hi, uh, thanks for being here. My name is Jeremy. I have a question about some of the larger national lobbying efforts of the NEA and uh, whether or not they're addressing what I consider to be the main problem, which is how it's like 40 or 45 percent of public education is funded by local tax dollars, right. which is tied to housing costs. So, is there anything in, and sometimes even more than that. Sometimes even more. So is there anything in the legislation that the NEA is supporting that directly focuses on that? Because nobody ever talks about that. No. Right. Um, I do. But, uh, and, and, but let me give you a, a, an irony. The most equalized funding for schools, Utah. We are all equally miserably funded. You know, how proud are we? Um, so you have to be careful, too, because adequate there's equitable, everybody gets the right thing, but there's also adequate. But equitable would be a good place to start. There's more and more studies coming out. We're sponsoring and supporting more and more studies and blasting out more and more studies about 
the inequitable funding of our public schools. When it's all based on property taxes, or most of it based on property taxes, it takes a small percentage uh, tax increase when you have the McMansions. They pay a little bit more in property taxes and it generates buku bucks. It generates huge amounts of money. When you are in very depressed um, areas where the property values are so low, to do the same amount of work, here's a school building we want to build. It costs the same to build that building here as it does here. You would have to tax the poorer areas a much higher percentage to generate the same amount of money. So it's not that poor areas aren't making an effort. They actually are very highly taxed and they get very little results in money from that. So the way we fund schools is unfair to students. And you just have to say that. It's unfair to students. So it's also up to your state and sometimes even your local school district how you fund schools. The only thing the federal government has ever been involved with, and by the way, they weren't involved with public schools before 1965 at all. We don't have a national school system. We have state school systems and district school systems. So one of the things the federal government role is, is to, um, as, a, as a civil right, say that you cannot advantage and disadvantage schools based on race, ethnicity, income. So where you have those, we've actually helped uh, with lawsuits to challenge that. It's very hard to win those lawsuits. Um, so while we're working on all of those things, the things that you can work with your state legislature, your governors on, are if we're not gonna completely throw away our system uh, today of property tax, how are you going to give extra funding to those schools that have so little? And I don't even want to count dollars. Um, we're not saying that, that the funding issue, we're saying because this school in a wealthy neighborhood gets some extra money and they buy a computer lab. This school in a poor neighborhood gets extra money and they um, tar the roof because the roof is leaking. And it's something that needed to be done that really didn't enhance the educational opportunities under the roof. So we're saying where are the programs and the services that these students need. That's why we want this dashboard, to put that dashboard in the hands of advocates to say, look at the shame of where these kids are not getting what they need. What is your plan? And the federal government can require a state. What is your plan to close the equity gap in resources and services to populations of students that live in poverty? We can do that. And that is part of what we want in the reauthorization of No Child Left. Hi, I'm Anu and I'm an education consultant. Um, and I wanted to ask uh, if you could talk about your views on um, reforms that need to be made to uh, career pathways for teachers. Because um, I know you talk about testing and resources and professional authority and maybe it falls under that, but I'd be curious to hear. Um, what reforms do you think need to be made to teacher career pathways and professional development? You know, there's a lot being done um, within the NEA and the support that we're um, giving to states uh, that are actually looking at um, how do we take that wonderful classroom teacher uh, who's developing her own classroom career and taking extra hours and, and working on a master's degree and taking workshops and always honing his or her skills. And how do we say to that teacher that you're not just gonna be isolated in that classroom for 30 years? One of the models, and I, I got to go to Finland in January, that was stupid. Um, who, who thought that was a good idea? But you know, so you didn't want to go out of the, you know, into the minus six weather. You wanted to get into those schools and talk to those educators. And Finland has a, you know, wonderful brand about um, being high on PISA tests and all of those things. But when you find out what they did to get there, it's beautiful because they said what we did was, first of all, equity everywhere. 
There are no poor schools or rich schools. There are incredible facilities and programs and services. And we put them in the hands of the most prepared career professionals, and then we get out of their way. And so as I talked to these teachers, they all had leadership positions within the school, within the community. Um, it was amazing. They were able to talk about um, who, was, um, the, who, who were leaders of collaborative teams and how those collaborative teams collaborated across school levels. They felt very nurtured, um, and they were in charge of their own professional development. So I think it's time for us to look at that model. Not only what kind of authority, but what kind of leadership are we giving to a classroom teacher that we don't want them to think, the only career path I have if I want to become a real leader is to become an administrator. A lot of our professionals want to be in that classroom. They don't want to leave the classroom. They want professional leadership opportunities. And um, we've got models now. We've got national board certification um, now. So we have, we, we're, we've got a lot of different paths, and we're trying to um, bring them together to say there are choices for that individual teacher to never feel isolated, to always feel there's a place to go and to grow. We've got the next two people, and then we're going to have to shut it down. Um, thank you very much for being here. I, um, you've spoken, really, I've gotten great education on a national level. I'm trying to find out if you have any examples of school districts or states who have successfully um, equalized the opportunity in a way that doesn't... Um, disparage the haves, if right. you will, right. because there are two ways to, to change the gap. You can bring down the haves to bring, or bring up the, the have-nots. And so what I hear, even in this conversation, um, you know, we get upset that maybe some teachers are getting more, and so we get mad at those teachers versus, and then they're, they're the, the enemy, or the, the school that has the great library, they become the enemy. So how do you have the conversation where the haves are not the enemy? And that, that's a good caution for us. Um, you, if, if folks that, are, that really want us to forget about equity and forget about resources and that it might cost more money, if they get us to fight each other, they win. And again, it's a distraction when you fight each other. Um, but your point is well taken. Uh, you can have a Robin Hood kind of uh, philosophy that says, okay, so we're angry at these, we, we need to take some of your money away. I've tried very hard in framing this equity fight to say, go into those schools that have so much, and that's what every school should look like. You do not want to take away their opportunity to learn. Their parents are right. They want the theater department. They want the chess club. They want French classes. They want uh, the chemistry lab. They're right to fight for those things. What we want is to bring these kids up. How do you do that without more money? You don't. You just don't. If anyone has that magic wand, please, you know, Get professional help. You're on drugs. It's going to cost more money. And that's what, you know, people keep skirting around that. And how are we going to do that? Maybe we could raise class sizes so we can buy more computers. Or, you know, where are the trade offs? Because you're not getting more money. We need to say that is the false frame. You have starved public schools of the resources they need. When you take a look at the most well-resourced schools that are producing, by the way, exactly the results you've asked us to produce in every school. If you go to Finland, they didn't do it on the cheap, and it took them 30 years to get there. So we have to go out there and speak the truth to people who want us to say, well, you know, the first thing you have to do is accept that you're not getting more money. Eh, wrong. We do not accept that premise. You have underfunded us. You have funded things like tax breaks for the wealthiest corporations in the world and got nothing for it. Um, and we need that money 
placed where it will do the most good. So I don't actually want to take away from these guys. I want to lift them up. I want to congratulate their parents. And I want to say that is our goal. Last question. Hi, as a parent support specialist, I'm responsible for connecting parents with the resources that they need, like food, safe and affordable housing, adult education. How can we ensure that all schools are able to fund someone like me? Because as we know, students aren't able to be successful unless their basic needs are met. First, God bless you. We love you. And I will tell you, um, when I talk about teaching in schools that have so much and teaching in schools that have so little personally, what you don't know is the schools that have so much that I'm talking about was the homeless shelter. It was the best teaching gig ever. It was amazing because we had you. I had an army of support staff. I not only had, I didn't have a health nurse, we had a medical clinic in the homeless shelter. I had a, a psychologist that worked with the whole family. We had counselors that worked to help those ki kids' families um, get the nutritional supplements and the housing um, that they might uh, qualify for. There was a security guard in the building to keep the kids and the families safe. A lot of them were uh, running away from domestic violence and loan sharks and drug dealers. And this was a connection that this security uh, guard had with the families. I had I really did have that whole community serving that whole child. Um, and I use that again um, as the example of you can, you can have um, the best teacher in the world. If you haven't given me the support that I need to do my job, the kids won't get uh, what they need. So now I'm looking and they're telling me that time is up. So I'm going to have to um, sign off. But thank you all for thinking it was important enough to come and talk about public schools. Thank you.